can start. Um, so this panel obviously is on contemporary art in Ghana. And um, we're supposed to be four people, but unfortunately um, one person will not be able to be here. I'm hoping that the person comes in. So um, you are going to deal with me only um, on the table. And then we are going to have two of my colleagues, my dream team for this particular panel um, to engage with us. So as a way of introduction to this particular panel, I would have to say that our panel members are truly uh, superstar artists who epitomize for me tra trailblazers of contemporary art in Ghana and who are also in other endeavors um, vary from their contemporaries. And it is this uniqueness that we want to explore um, today. So in, in case you are wondering what qualifies me uh, to be the moderator for this panel, first of all, for the past 12 years, I, I have been a keen observer as well as an attendee of most of the um, things that happen within the art scene in Ghana. I'm also a collector um, of uh, popular art, um, hand-painted movie posters, um, beer labels, <laughs> and beauty saloon, power shop and beauty saloon signs. Um, so this is my little qualification that you know uh, qualifies me to be um, how's it called, a moderator for this particular panel. So as a way of orienting um, our audience regarding who you are, um, Ibrahim and Kwame, can you please tell us a little bit about, you know, um, who you are? So maybe we'll start with uh, Kwame and then Ibrahim can follow. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Kwame Akutoba Anko. I'm, um, Founder of Ancestor Project, which is a nonprofit organization that is uh, interested in uh, preservation of tangible, intangible African heritage, promoting it, and also empowering African youth in the diaspora. Um, as part of what we do as Ancestor Project, um, one uh, very one of our projects has really stood out now, which is what people know me for now. That has been also being the founder of Inchinchin Museum in Ada, and then also um, being very uh, keen on uh, racial justice for uh, people of African descent in Ghana and then all over the world. So this is what I do. Uh, I'm an educator and an, I'm an artist, and I'm excited to be on this panel with Ibrahim today. Ibrahim. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Kwame. And thank you very much, Dr. Odro, and everyone who's been, uh, who's organized this program. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Mahama. I guess I'm a visual artist. I trained at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, like uh, Kwame. And the interesting fact is that when I was in my first year, in um, Ken University, Eugene Akoto Bamfo was my TA. Yeah, <laughs> he was a teaching assistant at uh, Ken University and he was uh, extraordinary. So I was very, we we're very lucky to be roommates at some point. And we've, he's always very much inspired me um, to want to even practice arts because you know, when you come from art school, there's always that question as to whether you continue practicing or not. And uh, Kwame was always one of those artists that truly inspired us. So I'm truly honored to be sharing this panel with him. And I <clears throat> started off as a painter, uh, made some sculptures. Um, um, when I was finishing my MFA, I made a simple decision to go to Tamale, where I was born, to build a studio. So probably that studio could inspire younger people to want to become artists one day or to take like to want to like uh, aspire to engage with culture or something like that. But little did I know that that studio would expand to become a contemporary art institution like SCCA and later on Red Clay and then Chroma Volney and all that. So the idea of building these institutions is just to expand upon the existing cultural forms and also just redefine what culture itself is. So what does it mean for the artist studio to be thought about purely within an institutional setting and what does it, what kind of constellations that does, does it allow for young people to be able to at least 
uh, interact with art and to be able to somehow access art from uh, these kinds of cultural angles. So basically that is what I've been doing in the last couple of years. So as the presentation goes in deeper, I'm sure we would uh, share some images and also talk a bit further about it. And thank you very much for that. Um, so since you mentioned, um, you've alluded to the type of artworks that you do and also the philosophies that kind of underpin that. I want Kwame to um, also talk about the specific art that you do and what ideas, beliefs, or philosophies that underpin um, your work. Okay, for, I, I have all, always been a multidisciplinary artist uh, for both my undergraduate research and in my master's research, I researched into uh, multidisciplinary eclectism. So what I do primarily um, bless all borders. I'm sculpting, um, 3D animating, um, doing video, I'm directing um, theater, um, working on, um, I'm, I'm, I'm directing and, and putting festivals together. Um, this, so it's, it's, it's pretty much anything that I can set my hands on. Um, if I don't already have the skill, my training has, is that I do the research and then I'm able to um, overcome media as a barrier to expression or expressing myself as an artist. So because of my body of work, when it comes to um, depicting the enslaved, uh, a lot of people have now started to know me for sculpting. Uh, but people who followed my career for a while will know that I'm, I'm sketching, I'm painting, I'm doing well that, carving wood, animating, anything that is I'm able to channel my creative force through is, is welcome to me to, to use as, as a means of expression. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and thank you for that. Um, so again, um, not again, just as you said, um, your work, you know, um, kind of goes, that doesn't sit within a, a specific discipline. So you guys are eclectic. One thing that, um, and this eclecticism also is a feature of um, Ibrahim's work. The other thing that is a thread between you and Ibrahim um, is large scale installations. Um, and I want you guys to talk about it. I mean, we've all been to art spaces where you see, you know, small things. But when we come to the body of work that you guys do, um, I think the feature is this large scale, you know, dimension. And I want you guys to talk about it. Why the large scale um, dimension, if I can put it that way. Uh, well, uh, for me personally, <laughs> when it comes to making work, uh, I'm, I've always been motivated by very small things, like very details. For instance, when I started working on the jute sacks back in the day, I was very much interested in the, the, the idea of the specter, like the ghost, as we say, which was somehow embodied within these simple materials, because these are materials which are brought in from Southeast Asia. They're used in transporting commodities from Ghana, mostly cocoa from the farms to the process, uh, uh, the produce buying companies to the ports, and then they leave, but the bags remain, and then they are used to uh, they are used to trade maize, charcoal, and other things. So I became very much interested in the histories of residue embedded within these materials. But one material cannot tell an, a story. You have to bring multiple materials together. So by through the research I was doing, going to different market spaces, talking to the market women, collecting these sacks and then working with them to piece them together. When I came to realize that I needed to produce works that somehow allowed us to be able to confront certain spaces, one of which architecture became very uh, evident within the working process, then the work just automatically grew by itself. Uh, so it wasn't as if I set out to make a large scale works, but when I started making it, I realized that the work began speaking to me about the form that it wanted to take. 
and then it it started from one thing. The small, the very first installation I did was like just covering like maize in the markets at Malamata market. And then it went on to covering like a bridge, an old bridge in Kumasi, then to the Science Museum at KNUSC, then to the National Theatre. So it just grew much bigger and bigger. But sometimes you realize that it wasn't so much about the scale, but it was about the density of information within this, within all the different uh, materials, because there are so many different materials which are coming from very different geographical points that come together in order to be able to make this in, this kind of installation. And the grand nature of it allows you a moment to be able to look at the individual materials, but also the totality of, let's say, the work that is presented before you. And Kwame. Um, it looks like his video is frozen. Oh, okay. So whilst we wait for him to unfreeze, um, <laughs> um, but Ibrahim, if Frimpon sees your work for the first time and it embodies the last phase of, you know, the, um, the, the type of installation that, you know, you do, I will see this huge monumental work. And that's what I wanted you to kind of speak to, like, what do you want to achieve with that? I know you've hinted a little bit, but if you can, yeah. you know, um, yeah. talk to Frimpon. Okay. Frimpon's daughter. <laughs> no, interestingly enough, you know, for us, we because we came from this very academic background from Kumasi, where people like Dr. Karikacha was trying to somehow expand upon the existing practice that Kumasi, like the art school, had over this, uh, the last decades, because a lot of artists were very formalist. And uh, if you were a painter, you were supposed to make a painting in a very traditional context or setting. And we were trying to expand the, the language that painting carries in a way, because if you take one of these materials like the jute sacks, they like from the market space, you realize that the market women would have uh, stitched the material over time because maybe the material is wearing out. So when you find it, you realize that there's so many scars on it. Sometimes they write also text on it. They, uh, some of them who are like, let's say the Kayais, who've written their names or names of their uh, parents or where they are coming from on their body gets transferred onto these materials. So at the end of the day, it's almost as if the painting has already happened within the market space, which was unlike the generation before us that needed to use the market as a point of inspiration in order to be able to make a painting. So you'd have to go to the market, you go to most of the galleries, Artists Alliance, others, you see many paintings and most of these paintings depict the market space with a woman and the banana, blah, blah, blah. But for us, the sack itself, and also in another generation also find that they would take the jute sack and then they would stretch it over the canvas and then they would make the painting on it, which for me was some kind of an injustice to the material because the material lifts in a way. So by paying attention to the scars and everything on it, you realize that already the painting that you want to depict of the market is already embedded within that. And of course, if we cannot talk about art without refer, uh, talking about economics and all that. So for me, the aesthetics also around art itself is embedded within it. So one, what happens when you take these materials that are coming from these spaces and then you sew them with the same forms of precarious labor and then you cover, let's say, huge architectural structures, which somehow for many people, they seem like there's a kind of disconnect between that. I wanted to somehow reestablish those forms of relations. So when people read those works, they take different meanings from it. One time I was in Kumasi in a market space. Uh, I think it was in Kejitia. I, I did one of these installations and a, uh, a, a man was passing by with his child and his child was like, he said it's in tree. Like what kind of an ugly, what ugly materials have they used in covering this beautiful bridge? And the father was like, oh, he doesn't know. Uh, but it somehow reminds him of the, the Ashanti history the Batakari, the one that the uh, Okonfanochi wore when they, they, he commanded the Golden Stew. Just the, I, an idea from history. And that was one of the things, the possibilities of making work that could somehow create multiple sensories or multiple forms of, create multiple forms of meaning. Whereas maybe uh, if it was very pictorial and if you see it, you'd be like, oh yes, this is what it depicts and all that. So for me, th those, those are very implicated within the decisions of making. Okay. Um, are there any activists, you know, uh, sensibilities to your work? 
beyond what you've shared? <laughs> activism. I think the activism, it's really within the actions of the work itself. Like the idea of, for instance, producing work as an artist and using the residues of the work in terms of the capital in order to build cultural institutions, that is very activist in itself. But I'm not really interested in activism in a sense of talking about it. I'm interested in a sense of action uh, the artists being very deliberate about the actions that they make and knowing the implications of those actions and how that can transform, let's say, another generation or another or build new audiences within the cultural sector. All right. So you want action? I'll give you action. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, in terms of the action, um, can you walk us through what Red Clay is doing, what SCCA is doing? Um. SCCA was, we started building SCCA in the beginning as a studio, as I said in the beginning, but eventually I realized that it could be much more than a studio as it is. So I was talking to one of these, uh, I was talking to uh, a couple of artists, including uh, Bernard Akwe Jackson, and most importantly, uh, Mr. Kofi Dawson, may he so rest in peace, uh, in 2014, 15. And Bernard and I, <clears throat> talked about the idea that it might be interesting to do a retrospective of Dawson's work because he's an artist that practiced for more than six decades, but there wasn't really any like substantial uh, exhibition that somehow put it, the body of work together. So for me, that even helped me to transform the idea of the studio into a contemporary art institution. So that's how come the idea of Red Clay was, uh, SCCA was born. Then when I started developing the idea of um, Red Clay, a year after SCC was started in 2014, I also said to myself, couldn't it be interesting if we could somehow still expand upon this idea? Because SCCA was, um, was built on one single plot of land that was given to me as a gift by my father. But Red Clay was a land that I bought that had so much potential. And I had to convince my neighbors about buying up their land in order to expand. So for instance, from buying a two acre land to more than a hundred acres within the area, gave a real possibility to really expand the possibility of what this institution could be. So then we could think about bringing the airplanes for the classroom projects. We could think about building the archives. Uh, currently, we're working with the University of Ghana, the archaeology department, to open up an archaeology museum at uh, Red Clay. So uh, the, the building is ready, and we're just working on the content at the moment. So it gave a possibility to be able to bring all these pedagogical forms, to make it into almost like an educational uh, institution, but using the idea of contemporary art and all the promises that it has as a starting point in order to be able to do this work. Okay, so at this point, I would say drink some water whilst I see if I can um, get Kwame um, into the conversation. Okay, Kwame, great. Before, <laughs> before you left off with, you know, uh, exploring this question of why the large scale installation, um, mm -hmm. And that's what uh, Ibrahim was, you know, just dealt with. So I, I want your perspective on that. Why not just one head or two heads like mine? I think that um, for me, the, the, the function drives uh, the purpose or the purpose drives the function. It's, it's correlated, it's, it's integrated. Um, but typically I like to plan um 70 percent of my work and then leave 30 to 20 percent to intuition um, i love detail i love uh, not being bound and moving with the flow but what i do now with my work uh, the, the 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 part that people know is mostly by intention um, because i am pushing a specific course uh, the healing of of people of African descent. And then I'm also pushing for restorative justice between um, Africans and our colonizers and you know, our enslavers. I'm also trying to empower youth. So for the first time in my life, when I, I started, uh, when I, I came up with this, I realized that I couldn't give in to my natural or my normal instinct, which is to move with the flow, and then
Describe this intuitive plans to impress. <laughs> okay, I don't know where you. <laughs> Hello. I, I, I think we um, you stopped that where you were saying that you didn't want to give in to your natural inclination to do something. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't want to give in to my natural instinct of just moving with the flow okay. because I'm I'm working with a a, a specific purpose in mind. So the, the scale was planned from the beginning, but it wasn't planned to impress. Um, it wasn't planned to um, as an uh, as an aesthetic. It was planned. Um, it was designed to fulfill the purpose, which was to give impact, create a space for Africans to reclaim their culture and then to also foster restorative justice between um, the West and then the people who have hurt us in the process of trying to trade and trying to build their own countries and civilization. So um, this is what drives the scale of my work. We are talking about over almost approximately 2 billion people of African descent. We are dealing with semiotics from people from a very diverse demographical um, regions. You can't preach one story, you can't say one language, and then you can use one image to represent all of these people. So definitely, we need to bring in the skill. We need to, um, I'm using my work as a beacon to draw in what others have to say. Um, for example, with my blank slate monument that went on tour, it's whilst I get to sculpt and I get to choose part of the symbolism, I also open up so that other people can be able to express because the, the narrative that I am putting out there has not got to do with only myself or my experience. We are looking at black people all over the world, rich and poor. And then we, whenever you talk about white uh, black people, then you're also talking about white people because black people don't exist in a vacuum. So either they are in a space where interaction with other races have gone well, or they are in a space where things haven't been so, um, the, their world or where they find them so having been so kind to them. So you you open up for all of these people to express, enhance the skill, hence the need for even more skill. Yeah. And and thank you for that. Thank you for that. Switching gears real quick. Um yeah. and then looking at a particular thread that really you know excites me. Um and it deals with this idea of you guys situating your works, right, within, let's say, your communities. And I would like you guys to speak more about that. Uh, unlike other um, artists who make it and then, you know, let's say, go away from their communities, however that is defined, you guys have been very deliberate about situating your artworks within your communities and what informs that. Well, um, there is nowhere for myself to go. If I see the continent of Africa as home, the, there is no place. And the earlier you realize this as an artist, I think the more you, you, you become it, be, it becomes easier it, it just becomes a natural calling that you have to cite the best of your work home so um sometimes um online i'm criticized for being very active especially in the u.s and leaving ghana out of it it's only until recently that people realize that i actually have more work in ghana than i have in the rest of the world it's only that um, what I was doing here uh, from philanthropy to um, education to it was not giving as much attention because 
Unfortunately, sometimes we, we tend to give attention to works of art as content, as media content, and not as a matter of relevance or something that is contributing to nation building and contrib uh, contribution to conscientizing our people towards a, a better future. So for example, um, I've known Ibrahim for a while, extremely brilliant artist. And Ibrahim will not get the attention until he's taking huge planes to the North. But if Ibrahim's work precedes the skill. Ibrahim, um, after school, I remember you were working with the Autism Center. Yeah. You were doing so much. I remember uh, your um, what it took for you to do your first, one of your first exhibitions um, at a residence that I came to. This man has been doing so much for the community. And this was right after school. We don't seem to get the attention until the, the, the West, you know, gives us the attention. So now he's in uh, Amsterdam, obviously chasing some more money so that he can be able to invest here. Now, let me, let me have a confession. Uh, let me make a confession. Previously in my career, I came to the art world extremely angry um, after researching our history and, and seeing what needs to be done to change our people and our um, environment, make us a better people. And in the past, I will be very angry at Ibrahim's um, direction of work. But a few years ago, I came to the, the realization, who am I to determine how or the process that another artist or another creative goes through to help our people. So this is why I was angry. And sometimes it wasn't only with Ibrahim, for example. I was angry with everybody, including everybody in the room, speaking good, very good English. We are highly educated. We are talking about in search of Africa's next black star. And we are not using tree, we are not using ga, we are not using dagomba or dagbani. And what happens to everybody else on the streets who are, by the way, more than us who've been, you know, trained to read English, read and write English. So I had, I was coming from this place of anger, even though myself at the time I had a master's degree. <laughs> and, and and Ghanaians couldn't afford to pay me for me to do large scale impact. So it's always home. Home has always been the first step. You don't even have a choice. I don't think that um, Ibrahim even had a choice. It, it has always been home and we love our country. We love our people. We, we didn't need someone to come and preach to us. Me, as a, a matter of person, I am doing what I do because I feel that the impact and the help is needed here. Everything that I do is not to draw the attention of the media. However, the media seems to be very, very interested in some kind of narrative. So I keep a lot of philanthropy that I do out of the media. I, I, I will prefer that all the attention is given to talks on healing, restorative justice, racial equality. I'll prefer that all the attention is given to that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I love our people and that is why home and then the community must have the best of me. I've been living in this area for um, the past five and a half years, even though I wasn't raised, raised here. Mm -hmm. I, I, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother is from here. I came, um, this was, or is one of the best places to, to have my projects and make the impact. 
before gentrification uh, catches up to Ada, mm. because uh, Ghana is Ghana is diving into um, the year of return, the year uh, beyond the return. We we are cleaning up um, to allow tourists in. Very good for the economy. Mm -hmm. um, except for when we start ignoring our history and then we water down the, the culture just to make people comfortable. The people who are coming in to patronize us and our culture and our art are not asking for something specific. Mm. We are trying so hard to give what we think these people expect. And it's it's unfortunately leading, leading us in some kind of direction that I is, is endangering our culture and is endangering all the, the intellectual contribution that we have to give. So um, the main reason for being here mm -hmm. is to continue to protect this culture that we have. Okay, here. okay. And Ibrahim, why your community broadly defined or narrowly defined? Well, I guess uh, Kwame said quite a lot. Um, it's important. Like, as I, the, the, I started this project because for me, it's simple. It's, I started with it as a concept of a gift, like okay. a, a transforming art from a state of a commodity into a state of a gift. Because uh, again, when we do a lot of work, we do a lot of research, uh, but a lot of this work that we do, it mostly ends up within Western institutions. And if you look at history, in terms of arts also, in terms of how a lot of artists, not just within Ghana, but within the global South, a lot of the very significant works of arts that have been done over the years have always been, have always ended up in museums in the West. Of course, we're always talking about ideas of uh, restitution and things like that. But even within the current times that we live in, with artists doing research and all the mm -hmm. recent significant works and things like that, even the, the, the cultural institutions do not even uh, recognize the significance of these art forms that happen. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it can be quite depressing. Like uh, it was sometimes when I tell people that I've never even had any uh, chance of interaction with the cultural ministry in Ghana. They mm -hmm. don't want to believe it, but there's never even been someone from the cultural ministry that has visited the institution in Tamale before. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you ask yourself, then why do we invest into doing what we do? We do it because we believe in it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think that the cultural institutions within any state can uh, really shape. They can, but in the in the in the state of in in the case of ours, it's not really happening. And historically, it's not happened. And there is this sense of. Um, uh, illusion that oh we are doing it because this and that but in the meantime there's a lot of cultural genocide that is happening because there's a lot of things that needs to be saved that needs to be protected artists works objects within the historical uh, context uh, mm. all kinds of things archives but all these things are diminishing like even before we were born a lot of these things were being diminished so you you come to realize that as an artist there is a lot of burden if you call yourself an artist, then you're really that cultural agent that you think that you're like the, uh, when we're kids, you're like the blue man in the film, like the, the, the <laughs> so you have to save, you have to save the day, you know, at the end of the day. It's not, I'm not saying it's in a condescending way, but it's like you really, there, there's a sense of responsibility within this act of being an artist. So if you want to practice and you realize that you have a practice that is very global, but yet, the community that you find yourself in, it, there might be a sense of detachment because if all the significant works that are in museums, that's kids go to do workshops, they draw, blah, blah, what, why not Ghana? So that's mm. what, one of the things that also really motivated me to build these institutions in Tamale, because I thought by building the institution as some kind of a gift within a cultural sector, then you can be able to, for instance, even allow other artists to be able to explore the possibility of engaging the, or the local audiences within the ideas that they are working with, whereas mm. maybe they would have to go to New York in order to be able to do that. And for me, uh, that's a total failure because success as an artist is not necessarily because you've made a work and it's ended up in the Venice Biennial, but how do those ideas which are borrowed from a local context, 
become material that the local context itself can digest. And also there could be cultural conversations that can arise from it. It is one of the things that I think, I think is one of the biggest failures of the cultural uh, ministry within Ghana, because for a long time, they focused on this idea of tourism. Oh, we have to do things that when a tourist come, but come on, we are not producing art for anyone. We're producing it for ourselves and for our people. In our cases, we end up, we'll travel and then we'll engage people in Amsterdam, in New York and others. But mm. fundamentally, if our people in Ghana do not connect with the ideas that we do, then it's a total disaster. Who are you producing the work for? So that's why, as Kwame said, there is no choice. We have to stay home and we have to do the work that is needed. Then at the end of the day, we as artists, we have to do the dirty work. You have to make the work, you have to engage the audience, you have to subvert the idea of audiencing or the idea of culture. So it's almost like you have to be a cultural reinventor, whereas maybe you are in a cultural ministry and then you have a specific set of ideas of what culture is. So when you have tourists, you take them to the cultural center and then you put together a drama group and then they dance and drum for them. And at the end of it, it's oh, but this is the culture of our people. It's absolute nonsense. There is a lot of things that need to transform and change and artists have like we as artists, we are the forefront of this and that is, we have to do it so that at least if it transforms the perspective of another generation, 50 years from now, you and I will not, or us in this audience, will not be talking about this. If there is a cultural transformation and a cultural, new cultural awareness, there'll be another generation that takes on another perspective, another point of view, and many different things will happen. We don't know what will happen, but at least it will not be the same as it is currently as we're talking about. Poignant, and thank you both for um, your responses. A flip, a flip side of the same question. Um, what are the ways in which Accra is not your focus? A place to be. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Accra is a bubble, you know. <laughs> Accra, <laughs> Accra is a bubble, you know, people... Uh, everything that happens. Oh, like uh, when people come, oh, let's Accra, let's organize some parties and other things. But there are things that are happening around the country mm -hmm. and there are people living elsewhere. For me, it's always been, one of the things that has always inspired me is that if you want to do something radical and something revolutionary, don't stay somewhere that you think it can work. Go to the places that you think that there's a possibility it might not work. That is when you are radical or revolutionary. You do something and then you're confronted by the realities in those spaces. And you go like uh, Kwame is in Ada. I was there a couple of, like last week with a group, uh, this African leadership uh, a fellowship. Uh, and they were really amazed, you know, as to the density of the work and everything. You know, I was trying to steal Kwame shine small. I was like, hey, that's my <laughs> senior in school. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, but it's really interesting that just by going to a place like Ada, suddenly it creates this kind of new cultural hub within that space that also allows for a new growth, a new possibility of growth within those spaces. Because intelligence comes in many different forms and it only mm -hmm. doesn't just come within the form of the human being. It also comes within the ecosystem that you find yourself in. So when you go to uh, in Chinchim, by the way, Kwame, we named uh, the our, our group uh, the Africa Leadership Fellowship. You know, every year we have to choose a name. And after going to uh, Inchinchim, where the guys were so inspired that the, uh, the name of our group is called Inchinchim. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's interesting that the landscape and everything influences even the way that they decide to place the sculptures and all these things. Whereas maybe if you're in Accra, because it's an urban location, there is mm -hmm. very there is a limitation as to what maybe an artist can do or what they can practice or mm. even the kind of audience that they can bring into the work or ideas that can be formed. Mm. Uh, Kwame, any thoughts? Um, I, I just think that um, I'll just back Ibrahim. Accra mm. is, I mean, before this division into 16 regions, Accra is our smallest region, in, is the smallest region in Ghana. Mm. Ghana is so much bigger. And so I think that people should just get out of Accra a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Go far north. Go go see um, what Ibrahim is doing. Go interact with the people. See the influence. And and then just don't go to interview him because you want a poster boy for successful artists. Um, <laughs> that's how I turn a lot of inter interviews down because 
most time they, they want a poster boy for success. They want to, mm. um, but what about the message that he's preach, preaching? Mm. What about the message that I am preaching? That is what is important to us is, is not to, if I wanted to be a poster boy for success, I could have reserved all the money for uh, this project and retired very good, get number of wives and, you know, uh, get uh, some Range Rovers. And that's, yes, that yes. is not what we want. And, and at this point, important. go ahead. <laughs> at this point, I will, um, I will, I would like to give credit to the people who have influenced us to have taken this path mm. and, you know, not follow what we, some of us saw when we were growing up, when um, you would have to um, display how good you were even though the rest of your community is suffering. I think that uh, a lot of who we have become now is, is dependent on role models, um, sometimes silent role models, people who have also lived good life, people who have written good books, and then people taught what uh, virtue mm. to us through the, the culture and mm. through um, their own lives that has caused me for example to be more happy mm. if I see people getting clean water if I see people being educated and um, I would rather sacrifice the money that I make for that than to sit in a Range Rover mm. and then you know be boss of the whole town yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for such wonderful responses. I don't want to hog the, um, the mic. So at this point, I think I will hand um, the questioning to you guys. So um, if we can get this second mic ready, um, we will begin the process. So I see a hand and he will be the first person. So please keep your numbers. I'm a numbers person, although I'm very bad at math. So, so Mr. White, you are number one, two, no, you are two, and then you are three, the gentleman in blue. Hello, please, my name is Abdel Osman. My question goes to Mr. Mahama, and I would like to speak our dialect so that he will be happy and be proud that uh, there is somebody here from North, from his area, Gumbehene. Please go ahead. Okay. Mr. Bame, um, Bagmatiam, Ulaka, and on Sunday, the Dagbamba, Zantanta, and Tara, Pulo, Domi, Yila, Tamil Culture Center, and Aguanya Culture Center, I don't bar you a chancham, and I mean a post social ma, the years of Yale Pum, Hal Mpoba, I've worked some years to do a pump canna, Dagbangari, Tamil Culture Center, Mama. Tumborna, I and Vos social. Tamakojas at the Nung Vienga, the Bambian Mamma, Catabazir Danfan, Kadi, Kadi Afan, Kara, Todd, and Pia Pum. Now you are some black bomb of Pum. Dummy, dummy. Yeah, thank you very much. He was asking a question regarding the cultural center in Tamale about ways in which we could uh, exp, uh, uh, create uh, initiatives that could somehow open up the possibility for people to interact with the cultural center a lot more. Like many of the cultural centers around the country, when you go to these places, they are very dormant. Of course, there are, uh, the, there are traders there who are wood carvers. Like there's a lot of scale happening within those spaces. And at the end of the day, it's just reduced down to that basic scale. I remember myself when I was in, um, in uni, in third year, we had to do cultural uh, industrial attachment. And I chose to do my attachment at the Tamale Cultural Center. So I was there for two months or so. I even did an exhibition there. So uh, sometimes I joke that when I was there, the, the offices, the way they were organized and the cobwebs that were in the some of the offices, when I went there almost 15 years later, I still saw the same cobwebs in those spaces because there is no, absolutely no funding within even those, those uh, cultural institutions that exist. And uh, you realize that maybe from time to time, they might have to rent some of those, uh, the off, like the spaces that maybe uh, drama, drumming groups and uh, cultural practitioners have to use in order to be able to harness or train their skills and all that to other people, uh, to businesses in order to be able to raise money. So he was asking a question of how we can contribute. And I think that's the work, because of the work that we're doing in the North and other places. And for me, that's the basic point that 
I started, I spoke to the director of the cultural center in Tamale because he was my, he was my supervisor when I did the internship at the time. And we have to find ways in which we can collaborate. So sometimes when we have exhibitions, we would put the logo of the cultural center uh, on our exhibition poster. We invite them, we have conversations, we go there for visits, for programs. So the idea is that if we keep focusing on the idea of building cultural institutions and expanding the possibilities of that, then it also allows for maybe a newer generation of artists to be able to collaborate with, let's say, local craftsmen in order to be able to develop their work. Uh, because um, you see that like there were there are these smocks that I ordered recently for a show that I did in uh, Portugal. And I ordered it around the cultural center, the weavers. And it was a lot of money that I had to spend in order to be able to like uh, pump into this economy of weaving, in order to be able to produce this fabric that they had never produced before. Because traditionally, if you're going to produce smock, you produce very little pieces in order to be able to make the attire. But I told them, what if we could produce it in 50 meters, in 100 meters, in 200 meters? Mm -hmm. So through creating institutions that can empower individual, like uh, independent artists to produce and to be able to explore the possibility of expanding the forms within art, it can also go back to empowering, let's say, the, the creative sector within these, uh, within these spaces. So it's just a matter of time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the gentleman in blue, and then we can give it to. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I know. I told you I'm bad with numbers. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Maurita. I'm an Italian writer. Um, so. Uh, my question is for both of you. Um, so you both use a wide range of media and materials. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about uh, um, if there is a relationship between the materials you use and the uh, local craftsmanship and uh, how that interacts with uh, the work you do with uh, your local communities. Thank you. Okay. Brian, should I go? <laughs> yeah, please, Kwame, go. Yes. I, I think that this is, um, your work lends us more to this, um, how you use, you've been able to use a room in, um, in, in preparing your pieces. And I, I can compare the same thing to Ibrahim, um, to Serge's work, um, using people in the community and uh, taking all these gallons from the community and changing them. Here at Ada, it's, it just goes a little bit beyond physical material. Um, what I do here, apart from trying to terraform uh, the, the, the space and all the, the, the landscaping, it's, it goes just a little bit beyond uh, over here, we don't, for example, we don't read on Thursdays and Fridays. You, you can't dig the earth um, Thursdays and Fridays. The material has a spiritual connection to um, what we are doing, and it's it's not separate. So that interaction is so seamless, even sometimes me myself, it's, it's hard to get because you 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 have a purpose. And the purpose is guided by spirits. And you are now going to change the material based on um, the guidance and the rules of the spirits or, or, or spirituality of the people to now affect. So is that you are working with spirits to change one particular part of the earth or the physical um, space to, to satisfy an objective that is still spiritual. So it's, it's a seamless flow of purpose to purpose. Uh, it's a synergy between our physical universe and then, um, and then, the, and, and, and spirits. And we, Definitely, for me, I involve a lot of locals in what I do. Um, whilst I've been raised Ghanaian like um, most artists, and I, I have been raised in cultural settings, 
I don't always, Ghana is so, uh, we have over 64 languages class. So the moment you shift a little bit out of where you were raised, the culture also, whilst being similar, some of the rules change. So over here, despite, despite being the leader, I'm also still being guided a lot by uh, the people of Ada, especially um, the chiefs, the traditional council, and then the, the priests and priestesses of Nohalenya Ada. Yeah. Thank you very much. So my name is Karim, and um, I'm asking this question as a, as a journalist. Mm. And much as I try to uh, not because of the many things Kwame has uh, said, I'm still going to go ahead anyways. But I'll just do a very quick uh, background to this, because yesterday at dinner, I had an amazing conversation with uh, Blessing here. Mm. and uh, another uh, professor, uh, his name I, I don't remember, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ben, okay, great. Okay, so it was, it was basically about food. And then interestingly today on, on the morning show on Class FM, we somehow talked only about food from mm. 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Mm. And it was perhaps the best show that I've had so far being on radio. Mm. Uh, the feedback was immense. And, and here's why I'm bringing that in, because what triggered that conversation this morning was apparently yesterday while I was here enjoying myself, the former president John Dramani Mahama was also addressing the nation because Ghana is in crisis. And among other things, he talked about eating local food. Mm. And we could have had that conversation within the context of the Ghanaian political situation, and then MPP people would take their stance, NDC would take their stance. It didn't happen like that. Mm. At the end of the day, almost everybody was so happy about the conversation that we were having. So I wonder, how might we be able to engage very intelligent artists like we have here, and mm. many others, mm. in a way that would make the conversation very relatable, and appreciated by, by the mass base of, mm. of this country or wherever it is. Mm. And, and that, is, that question is also coming because I am also confused uh, because my understanding of art and successful art is that it must possess this ingenuity, uh, this skill, this excellence out of the ordinary. And by that in itself, mm. it seems to depart and alienate those who may be regarded as the, the masses, the unartistic, and all of that. So I guess the first thing is, what is art really, in the sense of how are we able to make it relatable? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, um, I want to pick the thoughts of uh, Kwame and, and Mr. Uh, Mahama on what exactly we can do in the media to, to have perhaps a more progressive conversation other than those that look out for the blockbuster, the, the, the excellent, the successful artists to tell their story so that we also get YouTube views. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's for the YouTube views. You have to get it so that you can make that money. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's interesting. I, I think that we cannot eliminate one. Yeah. But um, art by its nature, fundamentally, it's supposed to be accessible by all. It's art is something that is mundane and something that is accessible. There's no point to art when it's actually inaccessible, that to begin with. And also there is art all around us. You know, art is uh, being able to practice art. It's uh, some kind of an attitude. Sometimes you realize that it's not just, uh, the reason why for me building these institutions was very important was the attitude to thinking about art. It wasn't so much about the process of making art because what is really art in terms of its constitution? Is it just the object that is made or is it a process of making it? Or is it those criticalities within the questions that you ask yourself when you're producing something? Uh, are those the things that con constitute art in, in themselves? So at the end of the day, you realize that, oh, if you go to, you can, I don't know, maybe your mother or your grandmother back in the days, they used to collect fabrics. So you go to your grandmother and she has a collection of, let's say, GTP, uh, Hollandese, blah, blah, blah. A lot of things, like some people would go around. There is an, um, I'll use an example. There is an older man in, uh, in Tamale 
Uh, his name is uh, Ben Saibu, and he's been interested in archaeology. He's a lawyer by training, but he's been very interested in archaeological findings for a very for the longest period. So he has been working together with, for instance, the Ghana uh, uh, museums, uh, Mr. Malik, uh, the guys at the what's the name, uh, Dr. Abba, the guys at the archaeology department at the University of Ghana, and all that. These are people that they've been doing things that they believe in and they've dedicated a lot of time to it. It's, an kind of, it's a kind of an art form. It's, he's not even really like, it's, it's not even his relation to art. If you go to the villages, there are people who've been collecting certain types of furniture or certain types of lanterns or certain types of pots and they'd be keeping those pots. Actually, there are things that are passed on from generation to generation or even in terms of like smocks and all that. So art is something that has always been inherent within the culture within Africa in many different forms. It's not like maybe in the Western context where collectors go to buy works of art and then they hang it in their rooms. These are even things that people collect and they are under their beds. You don't immediately don't see it when you get into their rooms. So for me, it has always been about the sensitivity. We need to be able to harness the sensitivity of people, particularly of young people. And that comes through when we actually spend a lot of time thinking about what culture means to us and also going into the into it in depth and also uh, building uh, investing into the right cultural institutions being it ones that are existing already like through the national museum and other spaces giving them the funding that they need in order to be able to expand upon the work that needs to be done employing enough people to be able to work within that field that can reach out to different communities expanding those ideas in different communities in themselves collaborations in between different cultures those are the things that um, will change the, the narrative eventually. And you guys in the media, you have to be patient and to understand and be willing to learn and to understand what these artists or people who are not even within arts or who are interested in, let's say, cultural practices and are, yeah, are interested in development of that. Like really take time just to understand and have in-depth conversations with them instead of like chasing sensational stories and things like that. Yeah. I will add that art, uh, by my definition, is uh, the physical manifestation um, after you've channeled the creative force. So you, uh, the creative force being uh, an invisible or an intangible inspiration. It could be spiritual. Um, it could be even uh, physical, but it, it, it starts with an idea. And then you channel it into something creative. Um, and after, if it's coming from a, a place of creativity, then it may break a little bit of the, the laws of what we think it should be. So for example, you can have writing and then you can have creative writing where the creative writer is bringing in something um, creative and is not necessarily looking at obeying the, the status quo or the, the set rules on, on writing. Now, without breaking into a full lecture, I think that um, the media itself has to identify your role. And um, this is uh, in answer to Karim's question on what the media can do. You need to, as a person and as an African identify your role and the, the, the role of your chosen field in the space time continuum of where we are as a nation, especially we are doing Ghana, we are talking Africa. My mother is 65 years old, 65, 66, turning 66. And my mother is the same age as Ghana. My dad is older than Ghana. You are, already brought up in a, a system which has become a mold. And we cannot break this mold by just being reactive. And a lot of times, sometimes the media is being reactive. I mean, based on a system that has already been put in place when we came to meet art, so, uh, what, sorry, when we, we came to, to meet um, this, um, this particular times, there were systems in place. So the artist is, is supposed to entertain us 
we create something fancy. We, we create um, um, beautiful music. And, and then once in a while, we have the token minority who is like Ibrahim and myself and Serge. Uh, we come out of all of these artists and then we are rich and we've changed the world. Yay, this is good news. To break this set mode and this system that we have inherited, um, especially after colonization, and then especially after um, the human condition that happened during um, the period of um, uh, um, industrial revolution, you will, the media has to be specific on the results that they want when it comes to nation building. And you cannot do nation building without creative people. So what we can do is to first identify how strong the artist has been from the beginning of time. We are the people who talk to the high class and then we are also sitting with the low class. We, yeah, Ibrahim is working with all the market women. I'm working with all the um, so-called uneducated people who've never been to school before and we are interacting. Um, my good friend, uh, Dr. Rachel Engman is digging up all these excav excavations with people. Some of the people that they are using haven't been to school, but then they have the knowledge, they have oral history and then she's using all of these people in the pits. Then again, we are also able to intellectually um, engage the logical thinkers and the philosophers and the, the theoretical physicists. We do all of that. I mean, when I was 3D modeling, I had to know the refractive in index of glass. I have to know uh, motion. I have to know human anatomy. I have to know so many things that probably doesn't immediately wrap off me out. You, you don't look at um, my appearance and think that, oh, I did some physics and I did some chemistry and I've done some biology, but this is what I do. And if you imagine that Ibrahim has been able to create a space um, about 100 acres plus, I have been able to create a space about 100 and 100 acre, acre plus here, given that we use the barest minimum that was available to us, then you can imagine what we can do if we mm. have the support. Mm. Mm. So the media needs to identify our role as change makers. We need mm. to identify our role as thinkers mm -hmm. and builders instead of just... Um, 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 non-purposeful entertainment. I do entertainment, but it's for healing. It's, it's, it's to foster a, a, a specific effect. And mm -hmm. once the media has been able to identify that, then that is where, that's the direction that the interviews are going to be coming from. Mm -hmm. But if the interview is because I did, um, um, I, I did something in Times Square, and as a Ghanaian, I'm in Times Square and I have all the media attention, then we are missing the point. And unfortunately, this is what is happening. Mm. Uh, this is what is happening. So whilst you think you are pushing us, it's mostly in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. That is not what our work is about. I know there are some artists whose probably work has got to do with that, but our, our work has got to do with getting people to think, getting to educate and getting and effecting change. Okay. And if, if the media wants to help us, then this is where... Uh-oh. Well, maybe it's appropriate um, point to... And being a media person, I'm sure. <laughs> I think maybe you can take the I'm next sure. question. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Send a message to him. Okay. Private chat. Okay. 
so we'll take the next question. Yes, the mic is here. Yeah. But before you do, I just wanted to say that um, looking at food, right, food and um, art, I wanted to look at the work of Brighter Queer. He's done something around Wache and Jollof, right? Jollof Wars and etc. So please look at that. Yes, sir. Okay, yes. Uh, I think that uh, Kwame and uh, Ibrahim uh, are showing us that indeed one has to be courageous to make a breakthrough uh, in life. Yeah. And uh, this morning we were talking about, you know, a concentric uh, uh, interplay when it comes to understanding African culture or Ghanaian culture uh, to be specific. Mm. And uh, what the two of them are doing uh, is taking the wind to another direction, mm. maybe to Ada and to Tamale. Yeah. And I hope other artists would come and take the wind to, to Bolaga and to, you know, other places across the country Keta. to give us Keta, to, to give the impression that when we talk about Ghanaian culture, mm -hmm. it's not about any particular group in Ghana, but mm -hmm. all groups in Ghana. Yeah. So I think that the two of them have to be commended highly for that. Absolutely. But what I'm, what I'm not happy with is that, you know, it's just like the two of them are, are, are very radical very. and they think that you must express yourself and you shouldn't mind uh, whatever has been the culture within. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this because uh, Ibrahim said that, you know, people might come to Tamale and you just take them to the art center and then you organize, you know, some, some people to dance for them. And he says that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, it can be nonsense, mm -hmm. but it is also the fact that there has been a dance mm -hmm. that people have learned to, to perform mm -hmm. and people want to watch. That has given that uh, interest of people coming from outside and wanting to watch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that in our culture, in the Gumba culture, I also come from Tamale in a way. Um, be, be, to be an artist has so much link with, with the religious, with, with the religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. To the extent that when we were kids, we were told that if, if, you, if you paint a human being mm -hmm. on a judgment day, you'll be asked to put life in it. Yes. And so we we're scared. You, you, you don't want to draw, you don't want to paint. But it's interesting that he comes from a culture like that and he has been able to rise up mm. not only to paint and to, to do other, other, other aspects of art, mm. but to, to, to create something that can challenge the, the, the status quo of the mm. town. Mm. And uh, I've been to his place and seen the aircrafts and so on. And I was saying that what kind of culture are we going to mold for the future? Mm. If we are no longer going to be too interested in the dances and things, and then we are now bringing aircraft for people to come and watch and other, other creative forms that are not mm. originally part of the culture. Mm. What will be the culture in mm. future? Mm. Okay. And then I've not finished. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, there's this other person, another person who was quite crazy like him, but not that crazy. Uh, he knows him. He's, he was called Professor Peliga. He also schooled in KNUSC. I hope you know Professor, the lead Professor Peliga. Yes, Professor I know Peliga. him very well. Yes. Um, he came up with a certain concept, the concept of uh, proverb symbolism, Dagbani proverb symbolism. Interestingly, I took that as my PhD uh, pro uh, project that I completed. Now, uh, he was able to create symbolisms, like, just like the Adinkra symbols, where you can use a proverb and create a painting out of it or some drawing out of it that represents that proverb. And uh, I believe that people like him, maybe if I may say crazy people like him, can, can develop that idea further after our brother has passed on. Okay. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. It's it very interesting to listen to him uh, talk. I, 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 it, it's very important that we have these conversations because to start with, Professor Pelega and I have been having conversations for quite a long time. So we even were working on a retrospective of his work at uh, SCC and Red Clay when he passed on. So it's something that is going to happen from January going. So we are going to do a large scale exhibition of his work and even the symbolisms and everything, we're going to like go, we're like we have make like, there were some works that were he was working on that he couldn't complete. So we're trying to complete those so that at least we can do a series of workshops around that so that at least the younger kids can also go into the depth of his life's work. So that is one thing. Secondly, I wouldn't want to be misunderstood with this uh, thing that I was talking about the uh, drumming. Like when you come to Red Clay, dancing. With dancing, yeah. Uh, when you come to Red Clay, with the, when we have the Parliament of Ghosts, we've have we've organized several uh, cultural groups from the art center to come there and then drum and dance. 
where we've uh, invited school kids from the region and then they come to teach them how to dance. They bring their fubu and dance and everything. My point was that there's been a very skewed lens and perspective to how the cultural ministry in Ghana has operated for a very long time. And the idea is that we have to expand upon that. That is my only point, that at the end of the day, the only reason why I say it's nonsensical because I, I'm angry, I, I get angry about it. And if you come from like, for instance, me coming, I was born in Tamale and coming from a this Islamic background where, for instance, you said before, people would say, oh, but uh, as an Islam, someone who is coming from an Islamic background, you're not supposed to make paintings or figurative work because in a day of judgment, you, uh, God will ask you to breathe life into it. But I didn't, I came from a family where my father was an engineer and he would say, oh, I'm really interested in how far you can push whatever thoughts and ideas that you have. Of course, at some point, when I was not even making the figurative anymore, my father was surprised that, hey, but you, what kind of art are you making now? But of course, he understood that the idea was to push the boundaries of what art in itself was. And when we're looking at culture, that's what we're supposed to do because no one, I don't think that when God created man, uh, the idea of drumming and dancing and these other art forms, what, what he left with us and say, hey, look, this is culture and then you have to protect it to eternity, to judgment day. It's something that has evolved. And even the different drama groups uh, through the uh, centuries over different cultures coming together, the, even the dance patterns and everything have evolved due to like uh, emergence of cultures and all that. And it's the same way that cult, uh, contemporary art as an artistic form that allows for these forms of radicalities and freedoms can allow us as a generation to expand upon what already exists. So for me, my, 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 my mission as an artist has simply been just to expand upon these things because there's so much freedom as a creative to be able to do things. And uh, if you tell, if without, let's say, SCC or Red Clay, when in the beginning, like if, anyone came to Tamale, you go to the art center, you buy whatever you can buy, their crafts or whatever, or maybe there's a drama group, they perform, and then you leave. At the end of the day, that's it. But now I bought this old silo, which was built in the 60s by the Russians, and uh, it was going to be demolished. And I bought it from the state and I converted it into an art institution. We have exhibitions within those spaces, even just with the historical aspects of these spaces in themselves. When we invite artists, the last exhibition we did was with a Venezuelan artist, Ana Alenzo, and she did this research in uh, Taqua with the gold mines, and she did this really wonderful installations within that space. Just even site specificity, the space in itself will allow for certain dialogues, whereas maybe if you go to the art center, you know that it's a cultural center. You're supposed to go there to interact with, let's say, traditional cultural forms that we know. But what if we could also build other spaces that could allow for us to constantly rethink about what culture is about. So for me, that as an artist, that is what I represent. I'm interested in the past, in the drumming and dancing and everything. I'm interested in maintaining it, but at the same time, I'm also interested in stretching and radicalizing it so that if I grew up and I'm, for instance, if I were to die and reincarnate and I saw a different generation, I would be like, oh, I recognize this from the previous life, but it has somehow transformed. And I think that's when culture becomes a lot more interesting rather than being stuck in a specific timeline. True. Okay, so we have um, four minutes and two more speakers. And okay, you let's deal with the two and then I'll use my prerogative to extend the time, thanks. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Nanako Jivakum Zen, a student at the history department and uh, student journalist and also one of Kwame's girls in training. Okay, so my question has to do with, um, Ibrahim says something that you have to go to places that you think you might work and all. And Kwame also made another statement saying that um, Africa is the only place he can call home and there's nowhere he can go to. So my question is like, we both know that um, black people love works from foreigners than their own locals. Meanwhile, there's been um, patriotic events and functions. We have Eat Ghana, Feel Ghana, Wear Ghana and all, um, Made in Ghana edition and all that. But at the end of the day, after these programs and all, we kind of, like the patriotism dies and all. So my question has to do with, sorry. <laughs> all right, so um, Ghanaians end up um, 
I mean, the foreigners end up purchasing more local goods at these events to, I mean, local Ghanaians at these events. And my fellow journalists also made this thing about food and all that. When we, in relation to the Eat Ghana, Feel Ghana and all, yeah, it has been made, but at the end of the day, we tend to um, import more foreign goods than patronize the local goods. So my question has to do like, what do you think is the problem as an artist is wrong with the black star in relation to, um, is it that they just feel proud in their homeland and being a bit two faced, you know, trying to create an impression to the foreigners and being, I mean, biased, is it bad? I don't know if bias is a good word, being biased in their own homeland. And I don't know if my question is actually clear, but let me use this entertainment scenario. Um, the Global Citizen Festival and the Tidal Rave, mm. artists, I mean, performing artists actually showed up on time, closed on time and all. But with the Tidal Rave, um, as of 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., no artists that actually showed up to make a performance on stage and all that. Mm. Mm. Well, my role is to transmit <laughs> and say that, please, the ball is in your court. <laughs> well, I will, I will, um, and this is from an obs observation, but it will, hopefully it will be able to uh, answer part of your question, Nana, uh, because... Um, and Kwame, I will, uh, uh, Kwame and uh, Ibrahim, because of the time, so if you can just... Okay, I think that the way we appreciate um, and uh, art in Ghana, and then the the, the the means of which we express this appreciation, um, is still evolving. But previously, in the past, on the continent, it hasn't always, or uh, because of some specific reasons, it hasn't always been in terms of money. Um, so here at Ada and then in some other spaces where I have worked in some other countries where I've worked um, sometimes the appreciation is not always in terms of cash whilst when it comes to um, dealing with the government or with people who have had uh, a certain style of education the appreciation sometimes comes in the form of cash so our people do love art, we appreciate our own, and then we also support. But if you look at it in context, or if you're looking at it in Accra, then you get a different picture. But sometimes if you take the appreciation and where it's coming from, if you take things out of Accra, then you do you do realize that there are a lot of people who appreciate what we do. Only they don't necessarily have the cash. However, when it comes to um, with Accra, some of our educated people seem to go for European style um, tastes. For example, we will, some of us will uh, prefer suits to wearing some fugu because of so many reasons that if I should go into, it will become a full lecture. But there seems to be this innate quest to validate, um, try to be modern, try to belong. And so there's that quest to be European. And unfortunately, it's not been helping our art so much. Thank you. Ibrahim. I think you are muted. Sorry, I, I was saying that because of the time factor, maybe we should let the last person ask the question. Actually, uh, because of my bad numbering skills, I think we have eight minutes. I was frightened for nothing. <laughs> okay, go. let's still take the last question. Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I do not want to defend media because all the all the accusations you've laid out here are true. Um, speaking as a journalist, we, we feel um, all the time. You are not the only group that we feel. We feel Ghanaians all the time. But, um, you know, Ibrahim, when you were talking, you said art is all around us. And I agree. Um, there are chairs in Kumasi that I think should be in museums, but they're just sitting on some veranda somewhere. Nobody's paying attention to it. So I wonder if you think that part of the disconnection 
we experience from media and from the public comes from the art being just all around, you know, it's, I feel like it's infused in daily life. So do you think some of what you experience, like, like this is not a special thing, it's only special when we view it through the, the, the gaze, right? If you think what is happening, the, the lack of coverage, the lack of attention, some of it comes from that, that we do not see because we're thinking this is not special here and it's only special when you get attention in Europe or in America. Uh, and then um, Kwame. So in Chinchim focuses on racial justice, trauma and healing, um, things that are related to colonization and the slave trade. These are not issues that are discussed in Ghanaian media at all, or it's, it's not even in public consciousness, right? So again, um, if you consider the fact that media is buffeted with right now, the cost of King K, um, Galamse, and all of those other things. And oil. <laughs> and yes, and fuel. Um, I, I wonder if you think, again, that's, it's, this, it's the same question, that because we are so consumed with daily struggles that we cannot even turn to, to just luxuriate in the arts that you create and to stop and pause and think, do you think all of these things are connected? I do get the part that we need to create, we need to get people to think differently, but I also wonder if you think part of the media handicap is related to these issues that I raised here. And then, and then lastly, um, a lot of media houses do, I don't know if you know, I used to work in a newsroom, we used to do morning devotion on Mondays, you know, very Christian. Um, and so I wonder if, you know, what I, I should probably just ask what role um, religion and Christianity plays in how people relate to the work that you're producing. Can you take the last question from the back and then come in, Ibrahim, you take up. Mm -hmm. Ibrahim, will you go first? Oh, when the last question comes, then we'll see. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but um, thank you so much for that ob observation, madam. Um, yeah, I think that um, again, madam in the making. We do Hey. <laughs> if, what we do, if it's fully understood, then um, the direction for appreciation will also change. So, for example, you talked about um, um, the cost of living and all of that and not being able to afford luxury. What we do is not luxury. It's education. And we are problem solvers. So, if you tell me if Ghana needs... Um, if Ghana needs us as artists to use our creativity con to contribute to the cost of living, then that is what we are going to do, or some of us will be able to do. That is what uh, is about art that sometimes uh, people fail to see. There is a pure creative force, and then there's creativity with intention. We call it design. And artists are able to, you know, weave between these spaces. So what I do, for example, has never been about luxury. It's not for some elite people. It's for everybody else. So once we are identified that, okay, this is who we are as a people, and this is what we can do with our, our intellect, and we are appreciated for example, not always in terms of cash, but in terms of opportunity. I don't know how much, Ibrahim, you paid for getting electricity to your place. Last time I was, I was complaining and then you told me you even paid more. Yeah, to get more. Yeah. To your, you have to yeah. pay to get access to electricity. Like I had to pay when I settled in the village to build an institution. They didn't have electricity. So I had to literally pay the electric companies to pull electricity there. Water didn't exist. We had to pull water there. And two and a half years ago, when COVID started and they declared free water, they cut the water from the place. So two and a half years, I've not had water running in my taps. So even the most basic things to run a basic institution is not there. So at the end of the day, what do you do? It's a question. Uh -huh. So at the end of the day, as Kwame is saying, it comes back also to the will that we are cultivating at the end of the day. And also I spoke about the idea of the, what's the name, the, the intentionality and also cultivating the sensitivity within a younger generation. 
because a lot of objects that you see around, like the chairs you're talking about in Kumasi and all that, one day you wake up and you realize that none of these chairs exist anymore. So we, through our research and going around and collecting objects and things like that, like the airplanes and all that, they were very important because they were cultural, they were they are, they are, they are memory boxes in themselves. The, an airplane is not just an airplane because of what it is, but maybe a specific type of machine with the history that it comes with. We do coding classes in them, drawing classes in them, uh, drone classes. Uh, where uh, we bought these computers that we work, do workshops where there are these guys in Tamale that run these workshops where they help kids to build like computers from scratch in these airplanes. So you are creating a culture where you allow for different constellations of thinking, which is, of course, uh, there are things that are around us that are mundane, that are ordinary, but we are taking these ordinary gestures and then we are making them into extraordinary things that somehow normalizes a certain form of thinking with, uh, within a different generation. And it's one of the things that uh, becomes very difficult for people to understand, particularly when they come from maybe a, very, a generation that maybe um, is not so familiar with that. And I think as artists, that is one of the things that somehow allows for us to be able to do the things that we do and it's not luxury it's just simply yeah. it's and if, if we can, it can be seen because I, I mean i'm helping certain vice presidents pitch their ideas to chambers of commerce i'm structuring their ideas that is the last thing that you will expect uh, in ghana for example that an artist does but that's what i do i'm doing uh, in the past i've worked on uh, educational uh, projects, um, uh, I think, uh, is it UNIS, USA funded educational yes. uh, projects, um, educating uh, from sex education to what have you, you know, and then in Liberia, for example, um, I've been helping to um, structure um, healing projects after the, the war. Um, there was a, a project that was halted a museum on uh, on the war and reconciliation and all that. So what we do as as artists and as creatives just goes beyond drawing for people's fancy. And unfortunately, that is the image that has been pushed for about what we do. And so people think that, hey, you do everything, all the important stuff, and then you do the arts to relax. But of, of course, giving the opportunity and the recognition I think we can do way more than that. Um, I just wanted to correct it. I didn't say you produce luxury or you tend to um, the needs of the elite. I said we cannot take a break because of everything that is happening. We cannot take a break to even enjoy your work. And, and I use exactly, exactly my point. The, so, the, the fact that people think that, not to say that that's what you said, but the fact that you associate or a lot of people associate that um, it's a luxury. You understand? It's 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 what you do when you are not struggling for life. You understand? But we are helping. We are helping in the struggle itself. So if um, if the problem that you are solving has got to do with food, we are here. If it's got to do with um, nation building, we are here. Mm -hmm. If our people need to relax, we are here. <laughs> our, our work is not only used for when uh, you need to catch a break. It's like you are, you are surviving. I, I understand you perfectly. Most people think, huh, I'm surviving. I've gone to work and now I am done. I need to, you know, go listen to some music to relax, or maybe go see some art and then sip some wine. But Nanama, <laughs> Nanama please go and sip some that. wine with, um, how's it called, Kwame? <laughs> okay, all right. So last question, and please, I'll crave your indulgence uh, for this question and the responses, and we will make sure. uh, quality day, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for a really interesting conversation. I have a long list of questions, but I promise to be brief. I'll just pick one. Um, so my name is Ama Ofebia Tete. I am a creative consultant. I'm based here in Accra, and I'm also program manager for Asiko Art School, which is part of Center for Contemporary Art in Lagos. Um, so my question is really about arts education. 
So I think most of us, if not all of us, know that there's a lot of work to be done in the nation when it comes to reframing arts, culture, what it is and how we learn about it and how it affects us. So Ibrahim, I love what you said about, you know, re-evaluating the language of art. Kareem, I love what you started to touch on about, you know, making art accessible. Um, so very briefly, I think my question to the panel is, can you share with us anything exciting that you've seen in arts education? Um, traditionally, we're used to arts education being about the craftsmanship, maybe painting, sculpture skills, but not necessarily the critical thinking or the culture um, and those kind of philosophical ideas that underpin the work that artists should be making. So I'd love to hear about anything exciting that's happening on the scene now in terms of arts education in Ghana specifically. Thank you. Thank you. Like, um, I would like to share maybe a few images on the screen. Uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Drew, can I do that? Just yes, quickly. Can. Yeah, so let me just share these images. Um, let me see. Okay, so. Um, um, let me see, start from. Yes, we so, can see. Yeah, so you can see on the screen. Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the spaces at Red Clay called the Parliament of Ghosts. And in the parliament, as uh, like thinking about art education and all that, one of the things that was also important to us was also about how the understanding of art in itself, because as I was saying before, it's not as if when you make the object, that's when art is made, but it's also the process of it. So for instance, an art, like an idea that is coming from a conceptual point of view, which has manifested into a point of, let's say, an exhibition, because there was a work done in Manchester titled The Parliament of Ghosts. And then I transmitted those ideas into the drawings into building an architectural form as an extension of the studio and the institution. So here you can see that there are brick layers who are building like the institution. And then you can also see the school kids who are using it as a space for education. And there are different sets of school kids who are also like uh, almost like uh, looking at some kind of a, a grand painting or something happening like that. So the fact that even in the process of building the work or building the process and everything, all these uh, young people are integrated into it. It's almost as if you're building some kind of an archive or memory unit within their minds. Very important. And here you'd have, let's say, um, uh, the, the, the caretaker of the space, assemblyman, who is taking, let's say, the village folks through the archives and things like that. Whereas in another case, he's working with them within the parliament in order to be able to uh, transplant corn or create an installation. You ask the question about the form of art. What is really the form of art? It's a question. So even this idea of like bringing ecosystems within spaces, uh, transplanting idea, transforming these spaces, whereas it's almost as if you'd go to, let's say, an abandoned warehouse or space, historical space, and you realize that maybe there are plants growing within those spaces. And then as an, as an artist, you take that simple idea and then you magnify it within the context of, let's say, an architectural form. What does it really do? If school kids are using these spaces as classrooms and um, uh, dealing with this idea of an ever-changing form within, let's say, uh, arts or within, let's say, an ecosystem, how does that even inspire them in terms of how they think about art? This is a collage where I try to bring in, let's say, an image of one of those English electric trains that were brought in Ghana by uh, during the Gold Coast and the post-independent era. So even the idea of using uh, history as a layer within a time of building institutions in a precarious time, how does that also influence art in itself? Like bringing like, so this is just a simple example. So this comes back to the furniture that uh, um, the lady in red was uh, asking. I think I recognize her, but I'm not sure whether it's the same person. But um, um, yeah, so this comes back to that same idea of collecting even these simple chairs that are coming from the early 20th century made by the British and collecting them as these kind of residues, ghosts, and then we can occupy them and use them as points of learning and things like that. But what happens when it's embedded within uh, this new cultural uh, space and what does it mean actually for art education in terms of, let's say, another generation that uses that as a different learning point, even with regards to animals, using it for lectures, like anyway, these are different kinds of images and all that. But simply that's the idea that 
Mm -hmm. uh, the training that we had in Kumasi, Kwame and I, uh, together with many artists that have emerged in Ghana over the years, was this idea that we could use, let's say, uh, philosophy and many other forms to be able to create artistic forms that could allow us to be able to, for instance, create certain forms of relations that could influence another generation of artists to be able to practice in certain forms. So for instance, these are some of the images from the aircraft uh, with the kids uh, using it for workshops, like doing the things in it, or even occupying forest areas. So for instance, I even bought some of these forest areas, which are sacred groups that normally uh, would be left because no one goes there because of the myth associated with that but issues of ecology and everything are within those spaces. So what does it mean when today you have, let's say, workshops with kids and today they are in the sacred group as, a, as an institutional space or context and tomorrow you're in a cultural center, tomorrow you are in the old silo, tomorrow you are in a, in a museum, in a white cube, in a non-white cube. All these different spaces, how does it really shape another generation of artists to think about the form of art and what it can become? So it's a question. The role of art within our generation is not so much the question of making art as a tangible form, but it's about building new types of institutions that can somehow open up new radical forms in terms of how another generation can somehow interact with art. So that is how come the practice of Serge with regards to all the work that he does or Kwame Akoto or many of the other artists um, uh, and the collective Black Star Lines, Exit Frame and all these other people are important or in the case of uh, Amaku Buafo with the residency spaces that he is currently working on as extensions of his practice and all that are important to open up the possibility and the potentials of art beyond the current uh, timeline that we find ourselves in. Okay, thank you. Um, Kwame. Okay, um, I have more um, as um, an art educator, I have more, um, been interested in um, changing people's perspective on what art is and, and helping people to understand. Because, so recently, um, whilst collaborating with some uh, Art Life Matters by uh, Erika Jare and then um, opening up to career um, guidance workshops here at the museum, we have been teaching intelligent types and that's one of the things that i'll ask those who are not into art pedagogy to look at um, so we are looking at um, basic intelligent types and identifying the intelligent types that is universal and that is um, helping us to create art so we are looking at spatial intelligence we are looking at um, interpersonal existential intelligence we are Identify intelligence types that creates an artist, and we are we are trying to teach this so that um, we start seeing artists beyond just creating for people's fancy. And we um, over the years, these are not images. I think the internet has struck again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> internet demon. Yeah. Um, I think you never really know how bad the internet in Ghana is until you travel outside. True. Yeah, so <laughs> I guess it's something we have to deal with. <laughs> true. So, um, let's give about maybe 30 seconds. And if it doesn't, yeah. Count, yeah. We, may, um, we may have time. Come again. Yes, they are wearing Kambu. Yes, <laughs> it's Kaba and Sleet and Kambu. So, Ibrahim, if you want to. Thank... Oh, it's cut off again. Sorry. Yeah. So, Ibrahim, kindly send him a message that we thank him and okay. you as well um, for okay. taking the time of your busy schedule to be, okay. to be with us. And so, if we can acknowledge, you know, Ibrahim and Kwame. Thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. And I will see you when you come back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> when I come back. <laughs> <laughs> or if I come back. Because <laughs> right now, I think I got myself into a bit of trouble. So Dale. I have to make peace with everyone before I come back. <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs>
<laughs> so thank you guys for being wonderful um, audiences. So thanks. Thank you very much, Doc. <laughs>